Good morning, guys. Um, I see just we got about five minutes till we're going to get started. Um, I just wanted to hop on and say, hey, make sure I'm getting all my chat things working, chat windows working right, and all of those things. Um, so I'm Jeff Anderton. I'm coming to you from just outside Jackson, Mississippi, in the suburb of Madison. Um, would love just to kind of hear where y'all are coming from, uh, whether it's kind of morning or evening where you're at. And so if you could just pop up your chat window, just make sure that works for me. That would be great. I may still be muted waiting for 11 or noon Eastern time here. Um, check something real quick. All right, so if you look at your menu bar at the bottom, if you may have to click on the three dots to get to the chat bar, but you can click on the chat bar and that's where you can ask questions and so on as I'm going along. Um, there's also a Q&A uh, one there where you can also put questions there and I'll check both of those um, as we move along through this um, and just trying to deal with the technology side of things this morning or this afternoon, depending upon where you are. So like I said, my name is Jeff Anderton. Um, we're waiting until we reach the top of the hour to get started. But just want to welcome y'all. Um, I'm excited to have you here. I'm excited to start this summer workshop series and just be able to give you as much information as I can to help you and equip you uh, to be ready to teach chemistry all that much better come the fall. Um, hopefully y'all are done. Um, some of you who are getting the recordings may be doing this uh, you may be in class right now, and I'm, I can't imagine that right now. But then again, you probably feel the same way for us when we're back in school in August. Um, and so if you can just drop a line in the chat of where you're coming from and love to interact with you all that way. Some things will Sarah's from Pennsylvania. You're somebody who's actually is afternoon now. So Pennsylvania's already done this time of year. I would have figured y'all still be in. Yeah, I know some people. So I know some people who are in, like, I mean, they're pretty much into the end of June. Like, I think it's like the Boston area. In some places like that, I've seen their schedules. It's just, it's crazy how distinct and different all the school districts are across the country is when we start, when we end. I know there's six or seven others of you. Y'all can all use the chat, by the way. You know when you're teaching, you don't want everybody to be quiet sitting in the back corner. So just do me a favor. All right, so we're almost at the top of the hour. So like I said, so if you look at your menu bar, if you're not familiar with Zoom, um, it's just a really good stable way of doing webinars and workshops. And the way it works is on the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, depending upon where it is on your screen, you see kind of a menu bar. And you may have to click on the three dots to open up the chat window. But that chat window is going to be the best place to drop questions, interact, and do that kind of thing. So just kind of from a technical standpoint, that's where you want to go to be asking your questions and so on. Because I do want this to be interactive. I don't want to be simply a talking head. Now, I believe I've got great stuff for you, but I love interaction. And I would much rather have that as we go along. So 
like I said, my name is Jeff Anderton. I am the owner of Teaching High School Chem. And you know, this is what I want to do this summer. I want to give to you all by doing this workshop series. So we've got workshops every Monday in June and July. And so let me get this started and we'll go from there. I need to do one small thing technically speaking real quick. All right, so like I said, my name is Jeff Anderton. I am the owner of Teaching High School Chem, and I'm excited to have y'all here for our first webinar. Um, I'm trying to stream this to Facebook, but it really seems like it's slowing it down. So I think I'm going to, because I want to stream this first one to Facebook, but I want to basically say the rest of these webinars are going to be, and the rest of these workshops are going to be simply for those who register. Um, it just makes it a lot easier for me keeping track of who I am, because I really want to be able to interact with y'all more than just simply. Uh, give you information. So with that, let me get started. Let me turn off my little window here. All right. So today we're talking about how to plan and pace your chemistry curriculum. And so first of all, I want to start off with me. Um, like I said, my name is Jeff Anderton. Notice the T instead of an S. Just got to be a little bit different there. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta. I grew up in Marietta, Georgia. Um, I'm the middle of three boys. Uh, my mom's a retired science teacher. Uh, she taught middle school. Um, she taught seventh grade, which I just can't even imagine doing. Um, and then I went got my got my chemical engineering degree from Georgia Tech um, in 1999, and decided I didn't want to be an engineer. Decided that my passion and my gifts were more for teaching, and so I got in my education degree from Kennesaw State. Uh, with a focus on secondary science and a specialization in chemistry. And so I graduated from there in 01, and I've been teaching chemistry ever since. Um, I've taught in a small private boarding school for kids with attention uh, deficit disorder and other minor learning disabilities. I've taught in small schools here in Mississippi. Um, I've taught, you know, a wide variety of subjects. And I've also been an administrator through my career. So I've kind of covered a lot of it all. So like I said, I live in Mississippi uh, with my wife and our two kids. I've got uh, a son who will be six in July, and I've got a 15-month-old today. Um, so you can also be thinking of my wife, who's got the kids out of the house right now, uh, so that we can do this workshop today. And so I am excited to get rolling here. And so I started teaching high school chem last summer. Um, really last spring, I had a passion and a desire. I've always had a desire to help teachers, to equip teachers, that that's what I'm about. And, and so that's what I want to offer you. And so to me, that's what I want us to get going and focusing on is just how can I help you? And so that's why I started doing that. Um, I actually left the classroom. Um, I was going to go back in the fall. Um, but really just felt that this is where I needed to spend my time. So I've been out of the classroom for the last year, uh, developing a membership site and a, and a course and other things to just try to help equip teachers to teach chemistry and to teach it well. And so with that, let's get into planning and pacing. So when it comes to planning, when you are trying to plan out your year for chemistry, I think it's really important that we begin with the end in mind. And I think a lot of times it's easier to kind of go backwards from that. And for me, I like the illustration of building a house. That we need to kind of take, you know, and I'm, I'm a big fan of illustrations, and I think they're really helpful for helping kids understand things, and adults for that matter. So for me, the first question we have to ask is, well, what type of house or what level of house are you building? Are you building a mansion? Are you building a 3-2? Are you building a little cottage? What are you building? And what that looks like in our class is what are we building towards? 
Like, what is the purpose of our class? Is the purpose of your chemistry class to get your kids graduated because they needed to graduate? Is the purpose of your chemistry class to prepare them for college chemistry? Or is the purpose of your chemistry class to prepare them for AP Chem? To me, all three of those are different things, and all those are three different levels. Um, and they, they change how you plan your course just a little bit. And so I think it's important to have those in mind. You know, also in your mind could be something like, you know, trying to meet state standards. And to be honest with you, state standards are a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, they try to have you cover everything. And if you try to cover everything to the same depth, you're not going to get very far. Um, you can cover everything in the state standards, but you've got to pick and choose. Um, some things are going to get very glossed over. Um, like for me, example, nuclear chemistry is in the state standards, um, but it never gets more than a day or two of my time. I cover it very quickly, and I hit it, and I move on. Um, you know, equilibrium is one of those things that I think that's more of like an AP chem or a college chem topic. I hit it. I introduce what shot ways principle, but I don't spend a whole lot of time there. Um, and so we need to kind of keep that in mind. So what type of building are you building? So for me, I am all about preparing kids for college chemistry. That's my focus. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about the other two as we go along, but that's where I'm coming from. That my goal is to have my kids to be able to if they choose to, and they have a degree where they have to take chemistry in college, that they can walk in and not get creamed. Um, because I've tutored enough college chemistry kids that I know that college professors cover nomenclature, naming everything, reactions, and moles and stoichiometry and conversion. They cover all of that usually in the first week, maybe a week and a half. And then they move on expecting kids to remember that stuff from high school. And so that's why I think I need to think those things are my priorities. I call them the big three, nomenclature, reactions, and stoichiometry. They are essentially the main walls of the house. They are the load-bearing walls that contain, carry all of the weight of the entire course for chemistry. And so I put my attention there. And so I start with what I think is most important, and then I'm going to plan from there. So most important to me is nomenclature reactions, and then moles and stoichiometry. We then need to take a moment to look at, well, what do we need to have to prepare the students for those key components? So, for example, in order to do moles and stoichiometry, you have to know conversions. In order to do stoichiometry, you have to know reactions. In order to do reactions, you have to know nomenclature. And then before that, Going back, in order to do nomenclature, you really need to know how the periodic table is structured and how to use it. And if, in order to understand the periodic table, you need to understand atomic and quantum theory. And so that's kind of the foundation to me, kind of your intro to the lab safety lesson, your intro to chemistry lesson, and then jumping into the foundation. Atomic theory, quantum theory, you know, quantum mechanical model being in there. And then periodic table. I consider those kind of my foundation. And so they're important, but they're not the most important. I spend time on them, but I try not to spend too much time on them. And then everything else to me is finishing touches. You know, heat and reactions, states of matter, intermolecular forces, gas laws. Um, then add, you know, acids and bases, solutions, equilibrium. All of those things are extras, for the lack of a better way of saying it. And how much depth they get honestly varies from year to year. Um, my pacing and my planning is never exactly the same every year. And we'll get to why that is in a minute. But so for me, I'm preparing my kids for college chemistry, so I'm focusing on the big three. And I devote more of my attention to the foundational things, like atomic theory and periodic table. And then this other stuff is, I'm not saying it's less important. I'm just saying, well, it is somewhat less important, but it's not unimportant. These things are important. They need to be discussed, but they're going to get a little less of my priority in terms of planning. Now, all of this comes to bear on what are we building? 
know, if we've decided we're building for even AP Chem, and you, if you're building for AP Chem, then you need to talk to the AP Chem teacher and talk with them about what skills they want you to, those kids to have walking in the class. Or if you're doing for just graduation, then I just tone it down um, and just get the kids through. Um, but once again, focusing what you think are key skills that they need to know. But what are we building? Are we building content or are we building understanding? Is the house that I'm building covering my chemistry curriculum or is the house I'm building my students' understanding of that content? And for me, it's all about student understanding. And I think that's critical. And you also kind of have to decide which students are you trying to just get the kids who are, you know, your honors kids? And if everybody else makes a C or, or D, you're okay with that? Some teachers have that mentality. Um, my mentality is I try to teach every willing student. You know, I have had students who have failed my class, but they failed because they did not try. They did not put forth the effort. I did everything in my power. And I know I had a clean conscience when I put an F on the report card because they were not willing students. For me, you know, I'm trying to get student understanding and I'm trying to get every student who wants to learn, I want them to learn and I'm gonna work with them. That may not mean A, um, there are some kids who are just B students and that's okay, but I want them to get a B when they should get a B and not a C or a D or an F. Um, and I wanna help every willing student. And so when we make that decision that what we're doing is we're focusing on students, and when I make that decision, I'm focused on students. And when I make the decision that I'm going to focus on every willing student, then what happens is that dramatically affects how I do pacing. Because planning's great, but it's actually the pacing where everything comes to, to, to fruition. And so for me, I believe in what I call student-driven pacing. That it is my students who determine how fast I go. Now, not explicitly, I don't let them know that they're deciding it, but I'm using them as my foundation as I go along. And the reason why I think this is so important, and once again, going back to the housing house model, if you're building a two-story house and you try to build the second floor before you finish the first, like finish framing the first, that's not going to work very well. You know, the house is not going to be able to sustain the weight. If you haven't finished all the load-bearing walls and you try to put in a second floor, that house is going to collapse. And I think a lot of times we as chemistry teachers, we get sucked into that trap. We try to move into reactions before our kids understand nomenclature completely. And we wonder why they have so much trouble with reactions. Or we try to go into stoichiometry before they really understand mole conversions. And, we understand, and we're, we're confused and frustrated that they're not getting it. Because chemistry, I think more than the other sciences, is really built on prior knowledge, that you have to lay that foundation, and you have to lay it solidly, and lay it well, in order to have the kids ready to go. And I think that's critically important. And so, you know, like I said, so if anything, if the foundation's weak, then anything built on it will be compromised. You know, and that's why I've got next week's workshop on, you know, dealing with students with weak math skills, because that's often a weak foundation issue. And we as teachers have to somehow address that, deal with that. And I've got strategies and ways that I deal with that that I'm gonna share with y'all next week. Um, but that's one of those areas that we've gotta look at. So along those lines, you know, if we have power over this, we need to make it a priority. If we have power over their knowledge, and before we move on, then it's our responsibility to do something about that. Because here's the deal. I've heard people complain, but it's going to cost me an extra, you know, couple of days. Yes, it may. You know, like, for example, when I do nomenclature, what's ionic nomenclature specifically, I break it into sections. I do metals and nonmetals first, binary ionic. I do metals and nonmetals first. And I make sure my kids understand how to do metals and nonmetals first. They can do just the really basic. They can do sodium chloride, magnesium oxide. Um, potassium sulfide, whatever. They can do those basic metals and nonmetal ionic names and formulas. 
Then I move on to polyatomic ions. And then I make sure they understand polyatomic ions. And then I add transition metals. And then when I've done that, I pull it all together with the covalent nomenclature that we've already done, and they have to do all of it together. If I move into polyatomics before they are comfortable with metals and nonmetals, I'm setting myself up for a headache. It is better that I take an extra day or a half day or two days to make sure they are really well set so that I'm not just absolutely pulling out my hair later with them and they're, they're just not getting it. Um, you know, like I said, so a few more days of doing nomenclature is going to make teaching reactions easier because kids are going to be able to read a reaction and know what those things are without having to sit there and, you know, look at a periodic table that's got the names on it and try to figure out what you know, what Na3PO4 is. You know, if we spent enough time with nomenclature, they should go, oh, that's sodium phosphate. It may take them a couple of seconds, but they should be able to get that that's sodium phosphate. Um, and so they should be able to move with that. You know, I've put a lot of extra time on conversions uh, before I get to moles and stoichiometry. And I don't even do conversions at the beginning of the year. Uh, most chemistry books have conversions in chapter one or chapter two. And I don't teach it then because it's not being used then. It's not being used until we get to moles much later. And so what I do is I, I save it. I teach it right before I teach moles. Um, and I teach conversions right before I teach moles. And then when I lay that good foundation, I make sure they can do conversions backwards and forward. They can do one step, two step, three steps. They can convert from any given unit to any other unit. Then I can add moles in it. And they're like, oh, this is easy. It's amazing what taking a little extra time, the way that foundation will do later. But that's part of pacing. You've got to be willing to sacrifice a half a day or a day as you're going along in order to save yourself times and headaches later. But in order to be able to do that, you know, we have to be able to supervise the building process. We need to know when the foundation's done. When have kids learned it enough that I can move on? Um, and this first thing I want to share is also just with kids facing chemistry. You're going to have lots of kids walk into chemistry who have been doing relatively well in school, and schools come easy to them. And all of a sudden they reach chemistry and they're like, oh my goodness, what is this? And they struggle for the first time. They don't get it immediately for the first time. They actually have to sit and think and work on it. And they're going to freak out because they think, wait, I should learn this the first time. But learning is a process. Did you learn how to teach immediately? Were you a, a master teacher in your first year? The answer is no, by the way if you're a first year teacher. Um, first year teaching is all about surviving and just getting through it and learning. The second year teaching, you finally get to apply, you know, the things you learned in school. And then the third year, I think you finally kind of get in your rhythm and you feel comfortable and you kind of get a little bit more of that master of teaching. It's a process, it takes time. And our students are oftentimes impatient with this and we need to remind them of this, of like, hey, if you already knew chemistry, you wouldn't be in my class. Um, but you don't know chemistry and that's why you're here and we're going to learn it. It's a process. Um, a classic example of this for me is when I'm doing quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is weird. Quantum mechanical model is weird. And literally I tell my kids as I start going through it and I'm trying to explain to them, you know, Heisenberg uncertainty principle and Pauli's exclusion principle and, you know, Hun's rule. And I'm trying to explain all these things to them. I make a comment. I usually say, all right, guys, give me two days. If you're confused after day one, or give me three days. You know, if you're confused after day one, that's fine. That's where you're supposed to be. If you're confused after day two, that's okay. I'm down with that. If you're confused by the end of day three, then let me know, and, and we can work on that. Because it's amazing for students how freeing it is. For them to go, oh, wait a second, I'm not supposed to get this immediately. It just brings down that anxiety factor. Um, and I'm going to kind of get to some other things that I think that bring down the anxiety factor as well and help kids with that.
So as we build, we have to assess as we go along. Now, in a traditional model, that would be this. Homeworks, quizzes, labs, tests. I hate grading with a passion. And I hate writing comments on things that kids may or may not check. And so I change my model that I don't focus on these things. What I do, I mean, I use them. But I, what I use is I use class time and classwork. And here's what that looks like for me. I teach roughly, this is when I'm doing skill-based things like nomenclature, reactions, stoichiometry. I teach generally about half to maybe two thirds of the class period. I'll lecture for that long and then I'll stop. I hand out a classwork assignment and then I walk around and I check on my students while they're working on the classwork assignment. Um, sometimes it's a homework assignment. If it's a longer homework assignment, I'll give it to them to start with. But then I'm walking around the classroom and I'm assessing where my kids are. And I'm able to get more feedback from them and give more feedback to them. Um, somebody just asked how long are my class period? My class periods are 50 minutes. Um, so I'm teaching out of that 15 minute mindset. If you're teaching out of a block mindset, um, I would split this in half. I, I teach for a little bit, do some classwork, teach for a little bit, do some classwork. Um, and that would kind of be my model of how I would do that. But I would still do this classwork model that for me, I find, and, and it took a little bit of training for my kids to learn to do this well. Um, but I'm walking around, I'm not at my desk. I give them this work and I'm walking around. I check on my weak kids first and kind of get them started. And then like my medium kids, those middle kids who get really frustrated when they make a small mistake, I check in on them second. And I'm kind of like, hey, you made one small little mistake. Don't freak, you know, because they'll just freak out and be like, oh, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. I'm so stupid. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> you made one small little mistake. Let's fix that. Hey, try the next one. And then when they get the next one, I'm like, hey, see, you got it. You know, because, you know, I love it because I'm getting an assessment of where they're at. They're getting help from me or from their other peers. I allow peer coaching as long as it's on task. I have to really work with my smart kids to not give the other kids the answers, but to actually help them through the process. But that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give them feedback and I'm trying to give them that assessment because what I found was I was giving kids my, their homework assignment. They were going home. And then we were spending half the period going over the homework and fixing all the mistakes they did and trying to fix all the wrong practice they had done because they had been practicing it wrong. And now they got all this wrong stuff in their head and I got to go back and undo that and then teach them the right way to do it. You know, and, I, and I'm spending half my period the next day doing that. So I've just shifted it to the front. So now I've shifted it to the front end and I get to help them before they do their homework. I get to make sure they have a good foundation and know how to do it before they go home and practice. And I find that this just, it dramatically cuts down on the amount of homework I've got to grade for accuracy. It gives me a great understanding of where they are. Where are they struggling? Because I can be walking around the room and I'm like, oh wait, they're not getting this point. And I'll pause them from working, go back up to the board, reteach a little bit to reemphasize a point or to show a common mistake people are making. And then I go back and, you know, and then I get them working again and I go back and assess. Because this allows me to assess where they're at without having to grade a bunch of homework, without having to grade a bunch of quizzes. And it just frees me up in a lot of ways that I think is really, really helpful. Um, in terms of being able to assess where they're at and what's going on. And the other thing here that's going to help with your pacing, um, because here's one of the things, this student-driven pacing, it's kind of front heavy. You spend your time at the beginning laying the foundation, and it's going to allow you to go faster at the end. So it's going to feel like you're going slow at first. But if you create an environment where kids know that learning is a process and they're okay with that and they start, stop freaking out all the time and you create a safe environment you know, with classroom management, 
Um, I mean, classroom management for me for years was so hard. Um, I hated busting down on kids because I thought it was between me and that kid. And the big shift for me came when I realized that classroom management wasn't about me and that student. Classroom management was about that student and the other 20 in my classroom or other 30 in my classroom. That I was allowing one student to get all the attention and dominate and the other 20 or 30 were suffering. And when I could see that classroom management was about me protecting the other 20 to 30, then I got a lot better at it. Um, and I was able to put kids out in the hall and have them sit there and deal with them later um, and things like that. Um, that was a big shift for me, but it made my classroom safer. Um, it made my classroom a place where kids felt safe to learn and to try and to work on those things. And, um, somebody asked if I do grades on the class practice. Um, I do sometimes, um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I mean, that's also how I grade homework. Um, it drives the kids crazy, but. I don't grade every piece of homework. Um, I don't have that much time. I, have, I like having a life outside of school. And so one of the things I do is I tell the kids like, hey, every homework you get or every classwork assignment you get is fair game. Um, it could be that I'm going to check it for completion. It could be I'm going to check it for accuracy. It could be I don't check it at all. Um, and they don't know. Um, and so I just kind of keep them on their toes and that's kind of how I do it because that way I kind of pick and choose and, you know, and I don't tell the kids this, but you know, checking for completion versus checking for accuracy, a lot of times that's to do with how busy I am. Um, but I pick and choose how I do it to do it. What's best for them. I mean, cause some subjects like conversions, I need to check that for accuracy. I've got to see what they're doing and I need to see where they're making mistakes and, um, and so my grading kind of change and, and vary depending upon what I need to get done. So that's kind of how I work with that. All right. So another big thing there for being safe is being approachable. Um, that's part of why I walk around the classroom. There are some days I'm tired and I do sit at my desk, but that usually is not as helpful in my classroom. Um, my students will learn better and I will be able to pace better if I'm approachable, if I'm walking around the classroom and I'm checking on them, you know, cause this is so great for my, my quiet kids who are never going to say a peep in class. I can check on them. I can give them one-on-one -on -one attention. I can do that. I can be approachable for them. They, they, and eventually by the end of the year, they're out, they're able to ask questions in class because they feel safe enough and I'm approachable enough and it really helps that way. Because when it comes to pacing, and this, um, if you, and you'll hear this throughout the summer with these summer workshops, I'm a firm believer, if you win their hearts, you will win their minds. Um, when my students know that I am for them and I am for their learning, and that I'm gonna take an extra day and slow down my pacing to make sure they get it, you know, like, for example, if I say, hey, guys, we're going to have a test on Thursday, and Monday and Tuesday, I'm just kind of like, ooh, they're not ready. And I make a comment like, hey, guys, you're working hard, but we're just not ready yet. I'm going to push that back to Friday. The students then feel valued. They understand that I'm there for them, and I want them to learn. Um, and when they get that, when they see that I'm approachable, and when I'm walking around doing this classwork and class time, I start winning their hearts and therefore I win their minds, which allows me to go faster on the back end. Once again, this student driven pacing is kind of front heavy. You're putting in legwork at the beginning and it feels like you're going slow, but the whole idea is you're developing this foundation of knowledge, but foundation of them trusting you foundation of them knowing how to work and use class time well and use homework well. Um, then when you need to go faster, you can't because you've got them on your side. They know you're there for them and they've got the skills that they need to move on. And so really for me, that is the crux of pacing 
um, is that we've got to do these things that we've got to lay the foundation and we've got to supervise that building process. We've got to watch it as we go along that that is so critical. And so what I want to talk about right now, just so that's the main crux I want to talk about in terms of planning and pacing. And so what I want to talk about now is what I have for you as teachers to help you grow as a chemistry teacher is that for me as a chemistry teacher, you can start by growing nowhere, meaning just not do anything to grow, but you're here. That's not who you are. But then I kind of see a couple of processes that need to happen. As a chemistry teacher, we need to grow in content. We need to understand the content. And probably more so than any class, chemistry is a hard class for content. 60% of high school chemistry teachers are not chemists or don't have chemistry degrees. They're biology people or they're physics people. Or I've got a, a guy I know who's an elementary ed degree, but he's teaching high school chemistry. Um, the content is hard. Um, and so you've got to grow on that content first and foremost. And then after that, you can grow in communication, that ability to communicate it to the kids. You know, because, you know, we've all probably had teachers out there who knew their content but couldn't teach it with a lick. Um, I had more than a few professors that way in college who were smart as a whip but couldn't explain it to me at all. Um, and so that's our second stage of growing is we grow in communicating to our students. And then finally, once we're really comfortable with the content, and once we're really comfortable with how to explain it to our students and every willing student is able to learn, then that actually frees up a lot of your mind to finally let your creativity, that real, you know, some of those things you were passionate about when you first got into teaching. Those ideas start to be able to come to fruition because you've gotten the rest of this kind of figured out. And that's what I see as growing creativity.